the Extension Educator and Project Manager for Click to Science. Uh, today we're going to focus on learning about the Click to Science skill maximizing your space and specifically uh, focus on barriers and solutions to using space. So we'll hear from Tara Dunker, uh, the WeCook Program Manager over here on my left, probably looks like your right, <laughs> on the webcam. And she is going to share some creative ways she's used her space supplies and time to engage youth in nutrition and physical fitness programming. So I'm going to go ahead and stop our webcam so that we aren't on camera all the time. And we'll get started uh, with our presentation. So first I want to start off um, talking a little bit about maximizing your space. Um, and what does that mean? So Click to Science um, takes a perspective that maximizing your space is all about how you arrange the environment, organize your supplies, and use time and other strategies to maximize learning. The way you arrange the environment and structure your learning experience can impact the way that youth engage and experience science learning in your program. You should be deliberate about how you set up and structure activities to give you the opportunities to move around safely and comfortably, have access to materials that engage them in learning, and is a safe, welcoming, and encouraging space for activity, for creativity, and open learning. An example would be to set up all of the materials you need for STEM activity at many tables, break youth into groups, and ask them to answer the question or solve the problem using these materials. Everyone has access to the same materials, and they have opportunities to collaborate and be creative. In the Files to Download pod, there's a Click to Science resource titled Space, The Final Frontier. This meeting resource could be incorporated into existing staff meetings to help your staff develop strategies for using their space to maximize learning. Maximizing your space can also mean making the most out of what you are given. We know space can be hard to come by in after-school programs as well as equipment and materials. So now we want to hear from you about the barriers you face making engaging learning spaces for youth in your program. So I am going to pull up a couple of chat pods, and I want you to first um, share some of the barriers you have to making an engaging learning space for the youth in your program. So there's a chat pod um, in the middle of the screen covering the PowerPoint that's titled Barriers. So if everyone could take a minute and just think about some of the barriers you have to creating learning, um, engaging learning spaces in your programs and share those uh, with the group. And I'm going to mute my microphone to give you just a little bit of time to think. A lot of common things that we all deal with in our after-school programs of having shared spaces, um, not enough space for the number of students, it getting really loud because we have a lot of different groups in one area, um, having to work from a cart. Um, Megan has a very unique issue of not having any tables to work at and only chairs, which that is definitely a barrier, and we'll see if we can come up with some creative solutions for that. Um, you know, few electrical outlets, low Wi-Fi. I think a lot of programs deal with the issue of not having um, very good internet connection or access to the internet at all. Um, needing everything to be portable because you don't have the storage space. So those are all things that we've heard um, in talking with people and working in programs ourselves. So now I'm going to pull up a pod called... Um, solutions, and I'd like you to share any creative solutions that you've developed um, to combat these space, um, time, and material barriers that you've identified. So one of the best uh, ways to learn um, about how to maximize our space is to learn from each other. So you may not have thought of a way um, that you could be, you know, using your space a little bit differently to really maximize the learning. And I'm curious to see if Megan has a solution for the not having tables to work at to share with the rest of us uh, so that if we get into that situation, um, you know, we can look back at that response and see if, if we could use that. Um, and then after this, we have this brainstorming session. Um, Tara is going to share both the barriers and solutions that she came up with um, for her successful program we cook. So I'll give you a little time to think and type about some creative solutions you've thought of uh, to combat these barriers. So I see we still have some people typing, um, but just wanted to summarize some of the creative solutions. So Megan did share that uh, they brought some cleaning products and wiped on the floor before sitting on it um, if you don't have tables to work at. Um, also using Wi-Fi hotspots and extension cords and tape to secure the cords to the floors. 
it looks like rolling carts are a good um, strategy to people who are having space, space issues and trying to get all of your supplies onto the rolling carts so you can just roll them out um, and get started. Um, Erica shared um, using copy paper boxes to hold lessons and supplies and then stacking them so that all the supplies are in one spot. That's a really great idea. Um, and you don't have to purchase anything, so it's a great way to recycle. Um, and it looks like some people have access to locked cabinets. Other people, um, you don't have to bring everything in that day, so portable and locking supply kits um, are the way to go. So I'm going to go ahead and take down these um, chat pods. We appreciate everybody sharing. And then I will turn it over to Tara, um, who's going to talk about the Week of Program and their creative uh, solutions to space, time, and materials. Hello, everyone. Um, like Melissa said, my name is Tara Dunker. I'm the project coordinator for a program called We Cook Fun with Food and Fitness, located here in Nebraska. Um, our program is in its second year of programming, so I haven't been with this program a super long time. I have been a dietitian for five years in addition to that. Um, from the looks of some of the barriers and solutions that you've been typing, a lot of what you're doing are the same things that we do, and a lot of the barriers that you face are the same ones we face with our program as well. So I think that this should be um, a really good sharing space for us. So I'll talk a little bit about our grant. We Cook is a grant-funded program put on by the 4-H department at UNL. It's a 12-week interactive learning program for late elementary age youth, basically third through fifth graders, and is currently located in five Lincoln Elementary schools. So each week consists of two hours of programming based on a nutrition theme, and it's spread over two separate days. So one hour of programming, or one day, is dedicated to preparing healthy snacks while the other hour of programming or the other day each week promotes physical activity and nutrition knowledge through fun activities and high energy games that we do normally in a gym space. So those of you with experience in the after school world, which it looks like a lot of you are experienced, um, may have already recognized some of the week of barriers from this brief description. For one thing, we do all of our cooking and cleanup in elementary school classrooms. And we're only allotted 50 minutes of actual programming time on each of the two days that we meet with our youth. So um, let's take a deeper look at these barriers and discuss some creative solutions that worked for WeCook and may work for you in your program. As with many of your own after school programs, WeCook is faced with the challenge of making do with the space we are given. With our program targeting the third through fifth grade age group, we knew from the start that space would be one of our biggest barriers. Since elementary schools don't have the family consumer science classrooms, most middle and high schools are equipped with. For the most part, the We Cook program is carried out in a classroom setting of some sort. Some of our programs are conducted in art rooms and grade level classrooms, while others are carried out in cafeterias. The common theme, though, is that our rooms come with exactly one sink, some tables or desks, and nothing else. These spaces are also often small and need to be rearranged to suit our needs before the youth arrive. So even though space is a stressor in our program, it's well worth figuring out a solution. You can see from these photos that our youth are engaged in the hands-on learning process and get a lot of joy from creating something for themselves and their peers. They don't mind one bit that their cooking club doesn't take place in a fancy kitchen. I'm going to briefly review some of our space solutions that may also be applied to any other STEM program. So number one, uh, make time prior to the first day of your program to see the space in person. This will give you a chance to create a game plan before the youth arrive the first day. Number two, as part of your game plan, decide where youth should place their coats and bags each time they arrive so they are out of the way. Number three, uh, we've also found it's helpful to have youth gather in a specific space, for example, at the front of the classroom or in the center circle of the gym prior to sitting at the tables or desks provided. An example would be instructing them to sit on their pockets on the floor in the front um, every time they arrive. This gives you as the instructor a chance to get the youth focused on club and review the lesson without youth being distracted by other things in the room or supplies that were set up prior to them arriving. Number four, don't overcrowd your program. So the WeCook program allows 15 youth to join on a first-come, first-served basis. 
This allows us to create a low adult to youth ratio, which increases efficiency and safety, especially on those cooking days. Um, number five, as Melissa, excuse me, as Melissa mentioned previously, uh, we split the youth into smaller groups to complete their tasks or project. This gives each youth a chance to take on meaningful tasks and create meaningful connections with their other group members and adult leaders. And then number six, when it comes to groups, we found it most beneficial to create predetermined groups based on what you observe the first week of club. So for example, if you notice that some youth may form cliques or cause behavior problems, split them up. This also encourages youth to make new friends in a safe environment. So let's go ahead and expand on the term safe environment. An important aspect we don't want to forget when leading STEM activities is environmental safety. Safety is a very basic need and is especially important to consider when youth are working with potentially dangerous supplies or materials. So in our program, this would be knives, toaster ovens, and hot plates. We want the physical environments where our programs take place to be safe while allowing youth to complete age-appropriate tasks. That is, they need to be free from danger and adequately equipped for the activities that will take place. All the while, adults want to avoid the tendency to solve problems for youth while keeping it developmentally appropriate. And then in addition to physical safety, we want environments to be emotionally safe. That means participants are not afraid they will be made fun of, insulted, or threatened. And so this element of safety is present, um, as you can see from the slides, when program rules are gone over the first day. We found that it's really helpful to always go over these program rules, and we've <clears throat> actually created our own poster. And since our program is tied to the 4-H department, we relate ours back to the 4-Hs in 4-H. But one thing that we found, and this isn't required, but we found it to be helpful, is to make your program rules interactive. So as you can see from the picture, we actually have that poster with some Velcro on there, and the kids can interact with the rules so we can um, we can go over that listening to others involves using your head. Um, when trying new foods, don't yuck someone else's yum. That's using your heart, and so on. Uh, put downs aren't tolerated in clubs. We try to go for a one to five or two to five adult to youth ratio when we're cooking. Um, we always emphasize proper techniques when cooking. And then adults try to act as guide on the side rather than sage on the stage. So another challenge we cook faces regularly is that of time. There just never is enough of it. When you account for the time it takes youth to get to the after school gathering place, take attendance, walk to the program location, and redirect focus to the day's lesson, you're likely feeling short on time with any program, especially hands-on STEM programs. In all five of our locations, we cook is given about 50 minutes of direct contact time with the youth on cooking days and 50 minutes on activity days. In addition to this, many of our classrooms and program spaces are not available <clears throat> until the final school bell rings. So that gives us about 10 to 15 minutes to set up the space before the youth arrive. So let's go over some of the ways we cook has solved the problem with time. All the recipes and activities were pre-selected based on a number of different criteria, but one huge factor was definitely time. Whenever possible, we selected ones that would easily fit within a prep window of 20 to 30 minutes to ensure there was time for cleanup and sharing. In some cases, though, this time frame was only made possible by altering the recipe. For example, whenever we bake things like muffins or cookies, we make them bite-sized. This gives youth a fun finished product that's ready to share with their friends well before it's time to leave. It also keeps us from having to eliminate the important lesson of baking from our program just because of the time constraints. Number two, um, our 15 youth are split into three groups of five each, with one to two adults supervising and guiding. Each of the three groups makes a separate recipe that relates to the overall nutrition theme for the day and shares samples of their finished product with the whole group. So this enables us to teach more skills throughout the program and allows the youth to try more new foods than if all three groups made the same recipe. Number three, not all recipes or projects get done at the same time, creating some empty space for programming um, for some of the youth. We've resolved this issue by always having 
um, alternate activities and games the youth can participate in together while they wait for their snack. So these include things like food and nutrition bingo, <clears throat> a keep cooking card game sim similar to Go Fish, and then other quick activities related to the overall program goals. So even though I'm speaking in terms of recipes throughout this list, you can see how the same time management techniques can be applied to any STEM program. The final barrier we're going to discuss today is storing the materials you need for a successful STEM program. Much of the We Cook material, material barriers have been touched on throughout this presentation, <clears throat> with a lack of stationary kitchen equipment being the biggest. Another barrier we face is that two out of our five locations do not store the kitchen materials for us. This means all of the equipment, supplies, and groceries for those two sites are stored in my university office, packed up, delivered, and unpacked two times every week, one time for each site. So needless to say, good quality carts and totes have become a staple for the WeCook program. In addition to collapsible carts and plenty of totes, WeCook has come up with other creative solutions to material challenges. So let's go over a few of those. So number one, we clean up um, with 15 youth, only 50, 50 minutes and no kitchen sink poses a number of challenges. The solution we came up with was to purchase plastic bins, like the ones pictured above on the slide. On cooking days, each group is given a bin of soapy water and a bin of rinse water. Not only does this resolve a material issue, but it encourages, encourages the youth to be active participants in the cleanup process. Number two, as I stated before, our youth are split into three groups, with each group preparing a different recipe. Not only does this help with time management, but it also enables us to stretch our supplies. For example, during any given cooking day, only one group will be tasked with using the toaster oven, while another group may need to use quite a few knives and cutting boards. So this allows us to stick to a budget when it comes to purchasing the supplies and equipment needed for the program. And number three, um, still speaking about budget, we know this may be a huge barrier for most of you. Um, our program was made possible through grant funds that enable us to reach five Lincoln Elementary schools. And while grant writing can be a daunting task, know that you can always start with smaller grants when figuring out how to cover your material costs. So I just want to close my segment by thanking you for the great and important work you do every day to create quality programs for your youth, and I hope this webinar sparks some creative solutions for your own program. Thank you so much, Terry. You had some creative solutions and ideas to share. Um, I really liked you know, sharing how you involve youth in the cleanup process by using soapy um, and rinse water bins, and then also some of your creative groupings um, to make sure that there's not too many youth at one station and things are getting out of hand when they're using sharp kitchen knives and um, hot toaster ovens, which I'm sure makes everybody's skin crawl a little bit thinking about it, but you make it work, um, and I'm assuming with no injuries. <laughs> minimal. minimal injuries. And I also, uh, Tara's in my building here on the University of Moscow Lincoln campus, so I see her hauling the totes up and down the stairs every day. Um, and don't envy her for having to do that, uh, but the high quality programming definitely makes it worth it. So um, now, to take a little bit of break from um, people talking on the webinar, we're going to view a video from the Click to Science website that features staff going outside with the youth in their programs. So the youth and staff are visiting a local wetland and teaching youth about animal habitats. Research supports that youth learn better if they have views of nature or even plants in their classroom. Uh, there's a link to an Edutopia article in the web resources pod um, up above the attendees pod that shares some ideas about effective learning spaces and formal learning um, environments that could be adapted to your informal uh, learning activities. So going outside can be a great way to use the space available to you to increase youth engagement and attention. You may not have a wetland nearby. However, you may have other outdoor spaces um, close to your program that you can take advantage of. Parks, the playground, and green space attached to schools, botanical gardens, or even the green spaces available on many college campuses can serve as a natural environment for youth to explore and learn from. So 
I'm going to pull up the video here in a moment, and during this video, I want you to think about how the space affects youth interactions and learning. So once again, as you watch the video that I'm going to pull up here, um, think about how the space affects youth interactions and learning, and we will talk about that after the video. So please, um, I'm going to play it here, and if you are having issues with the video, please type those issues into the chat pod. to get a chance to go out in here to this very special habitat. Now, can anybody tell me what habitat do we have out here that we are looking at? A wetland. Very good. Now, why do you think it's called a wetland? It means that we have water out here. That's exactly right. The think you don't have enough space for youth to engage in and learn about animal habitats? Think again. Watch as frontline staff use a local spring and a simple nature walk to discover and learn about animals that exist in their local area. Guided by what youth hear and see, youth learn about habitat and the importance of conserving their wetland area. Frontline staff have researched the local wildlife and prepared themselves for an excellent lesson on animal habitat. All right, excellent. So friends, we're going to be really respectful of this area that we are going into. This is the animal's home and their habitat, and we're going to respect that by keeping our noise level nice and low. Look at my eyes. The first bird I want us to look at and identify is actually hidden. Does anybody know when an animal has something that helps them to hide in the environment? What is that thing called when an animal has that to hide? Camouflage, exactly. So this animal is very well camouflaged. If you look over here, straight across on the little island over there, this bird, she is sitting on a nest. I saw another bird. I saw a turtle. I saw a goose over there and a female goose over there. And I see some bugs. How can animals use plants? Why are plants an important part for the animals that live here? Why? For energy, why? Because they eat them, right? Excellent. How else are plants important for animals to survive? Sleep on them, yes. They use them for shelter. Air, yes. They help with the air quality. Excellent. Can anybody see anything out here that does not belong in this habitat? Yes. What does not belong? What doesn't belong? The garbage. The garbage does not belong. People who uh, throw away trash up by the businesses and up by the road. The rainwater washes that down and into this habitat where the animals and plants live. Now friends, is that a good idea to have trash in our habitat? No. What makes that tree a good place to have some babies? What do you think? They can hide their food from other predators. Hide their food from predators, that's right. Why else? It has a hole so they can, so they can have warmth. They can have warmth, excellent. Let's look at our rock and see what we can find. So look really, really closely. Rock. Look at your rock too. Look really, really closely. So we found some eggs in here. They might be frog eggs. It could be fish eggs. I think we found lots of algae growing on this rock. Well, that's pretty neat. All right, so hopefully you all were able to see the video. Um, I'm going to pull up a new chat pod here in the middle of the screen, and I want you to share what you noticed about um, how the learning environment in that space um, affected youth interactions and learning. So please share what you noticed from the video um, or ideas the video sparked about how space affects youth interactions and learning. And I'm going to go ahead and mute my microphone to give you a little time to think and type. So we've still got a few people typing, um, but just wanted to um, summarize what I saw coming up in the chat pod, um, that the youth were really engaged in the environment. They were paying attention, they were using their senses, they were using the tools that they were given um, to look at the different animals and talk about uh, the different you know, habitats that were in the wetland. Um, the uh, facilitators were using a lot of questions a varied order to kind of keep the youth engaged. And I noticed something that 
you know, after you work with youth, you are aware of, but I didn't see like pushing and shoving to see. Um, and that sometimes happens when we're doing um, a demonstration or an activity. If not all the youth can see what's going on in the middle of the space, they might, um, you know, be try kind of clamoring uh, to get there and see that. And because they were in this really nice wide open space, they could all line up along the fence and have kind of the same vantage point um, of that area. Now, that's not always feasible. We know that. Um, but that's just something I noticed that, you know, making sure there's a lot of space for them to interact with and that they can each kind of go off on their own and do a little exploring um, really made that it look like uh, to be a meaningful learning experience for those youth. So thank you all for sharing. So this was a shorter webinar. Um, we're kind of to our last little portion here, um, and then we'll wrap things up. But we heard um, you know, from Tara, we heard from our participants in the webinar, um, the different ideas about how we can creatively use our space, materials, and time. So I want um, everyone to share one new idea that they got from this webinar today, or something that sparked a new idea. So maybe you didn't actually get a new idea from anything that someone else said, but just thinking about it um, and watching the video or having these conversations with your peers really made you think of a new, um, cool way that you could use your space, um, your time, or your materials in your program to really make the most of it. Because you know, Tara shared some really great strategies. Um, we had a lot of our participants share some great strategies of how to overcome you know, not having tables, overcome not having a storage space, or overcome you know, the, the stress of having to get supplies out every day, but not having a place to have them set up at. So I'll take, give you a little bit of time where I'm not talking, and you can just think um, and share one new idea that you're going to take away and use in your program. The popular one was the rules chart. Um, so thank you, for Tara, for presenting that new idea to us. Um, also, you know, making large groups a little bit smaller um, to manage some of those uh, behaviors and also make the program safe. Um, looks like we have someone who's going to utilize um, going outside and engaging um, youth in some outdoor education. Um, and I liked uh, Patricia's comment that what you have is sufficient uh, for creating a great program. And I think that's a good takeaway from this is that, you know, you don't have to have the biggest, best, most expensive things um, to have a great program or, you know, have tons of people or tons of space. You know, whatever you have, um, you can work with and still make it a really positive learning experience for you. So I'm glad that you pointed that out, that, you know, we're all working with limited budgets, uh, limited people. You know, there's always never enough people uh, to go around to to work with all the youth and limited time. So we're doing the best with what we've got, and I hope that this, um, you know, webinar kind of made you see that, you know, there's different creative things that we could do to make um, our programs even better using what we have. So I think I summarized most of the ideas that came through. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and remove that chat pod and then do our wrap up. So if you have any questions um, about anything that you heard today or you're having some struggle um, with any space issues and you want to, you know, kind of do crowdsource, uh, the group for some solutions to that, go ahead and type those into the chat pod. Um, otherwise, um, we look forward to seeing you uh, for our next webinar. It's December 14th, and our focus will be on making authentic assessments of STEM learning. We'll have Perrin Chick from the Acres Project in Maine Mathematics and Science Alliance, um, who's going to join us to talk about formative assessment and their in-depth coaching project. Um, and I also want to thank our guest, Tara Dunker, for sharing her expertise with us today I'm in engaging with our audience. So thank you so much, Tara. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, that is the end of our prepared content. So if you want to take a moment to click on the links, um, download the files, and type in any questions, uh, we'll stay on for just a moment. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.